Welcome to the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nedling. You are about to discover impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you, so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Be sure you visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now tune in, get ready, and enjoy the journey of emerging as a leader of exception in the 21st century. Welcome everyone to the Find Your Leadership Confidence podcast. I'm your host, Vicki Nethling, coming to you from Roswell, Georgia. The goal of this podcast is to bring topics and guests that will empower you to become a confident leader and take your business and your life to the next level. Today, I am very excited to be speaking with Kristen Mallon, and let me tell you a little bit about her. She is a board-certified nurse midwife, menopause and feminine longevity expert, breast health expert, published author, and mother of four. She graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, with a degree of psychology and completed her bachelor's degree in nursing at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Maryland. After completing her master's degree in science and midwifery at New York University, she began practicing as a board-certified nurse midwife in private practice in Brooklyn, New York. In 2022, she co-founded Femgevity a telemedicine company focused on menopause and feminine longevity, providing concierge care for women seeking personalized health care. As a California native, Kristen loves surfing snow, hanging with her family in the northern New Jersey. Today, our interview is going to be themed on menopause. There's a hormone for that. Please join me in welcoming my guest, Kristen Mallon. Kristen, we're going to talk about a topic that everybody wants to know answers to, but we don't always get them right away. So I'm excited to share some time with you today. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, we already answered that first easy question I had, but um, how long have you been in New Jersey? Um, since 2009, so 15 years, uh, enough time to miss that California sun. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. I, I go back to California quite often, like a couple times a year. So it kind of feels, feels like I'm still there in some ways. Yeah. I spent a good bit of time for work in San Diego and, uh, and up and down the coast of California. So I can appreciate it. <laughs> the only thing we miss is the track or don't miss is the traffic. Yeah. So give us a little bit about your um your reason for going into this kind of expertise of you know, was it family history or what just in, inspired you that you needed to try to help with these we women that um have had issues with menopause and and are concerned about our life as we age. Yeah. So I really always liked medicine. I really liked um, understanding about the medical field, but I wanted to be in a field where people were well, and it was about optimization of health. And so there's not a lot of choices when it comes to medicine and wellness. And I found that pregnancy was just a physiological state. It's not a pathological state women's health in general, um, because women tend to go to the doctor usually yearly for different reasons because they're seeking birth control or they have minor issues or they just want to have an annual pap smear. There was a significant opportunity in the women's health space to get into wellness and medicine. And I was going to become an OBGYN. And then I decided that um, I didn't actually want to spend all of that time on oncology and all of that time on GYN pathology. And I really just wanted to work with wellness. And so that's when I specialized and became a midwife. When it comes to um, the midlife or the 40s to 60s, which is kind of where I'm focusing now, it just was a natural evolution when I started my career almost 20 years ago. 
women were in their 20s, 30s, and 40s having children. And now those same clients of mine are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, and their needs are just different. And so that kind of mm-hmm. made my practice evolve because I was very attached to my clients and I wanted to continue to evolve with them. When I was looking into the space, probably 15 years ago or so, maybe even 12 years ago, I thought I would refer because we're not really trained OBGYN aren't really trained, midwives aren't trained in menopause and in midlife care. And there was no one to refer to. There was no one that was doing this 12 years ago. You know, now there's more, it's becoming a little bit more known, but there's still, I think, a really big need for this type of care in midlife. And so I was like, well, I better figure this out. Look to the international uh, literature, went to international organizations, um, and just kind of found those few colleagues who were doing this work at the time, and then grew my knowledge base. And then now that's the majority of what I do today. Kristen, that's awesome. So what do you see for the future of menopause healthcare and longevity for women? I know you said that it's getting better. And I know I've now interviewed, I think, three people on the topic. And I'm one of those that's the, in uh, would have been one of your clients. I'm 66 now. So, you know, I know what it's been like. So share with us, what is the future going to bring for us? So I think that the future of menopause care hopefully is going to have more menopause specialists like myself, more people who niche down. I think it's kind of hard for us to use OBGYNs as this catch-all. OBGYNs are kind of seen as a renaissance doctor, like they're supposed to be experts in all of these different things, endometriosis, fibroids, childbirth, pregnancy, and menopause. And we're starting to see that a little bit in medicine now with breast specialists. So OBGYNs can become breast specialists and breast health specialists. And I think we're going to start to see the same for menopause too. At least I hope we will. And um, for women, what I hope they can expect is just a lot more breadth of treatment options. You know, a lot of times now when women go to their OBGYN, they're really just given the choice of like an estrogen patch. Um or some some estrogen progesterone combination patch or pill. Mm -hmm. And that's just, in my experience, because we do so many different tests, so many different, we offer so many different options for for treatments. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm excited to have what we're doing at Femgevity Health kind of become more mainstream and giving women like the breadth of treatment options that are available for this time of life. Awesome. So- why is finding that specialist um, so very important? So the finding a specialist is really important because otherwise women are going to be narrowed down into just kind of whatever mm-hmm. that doctor's expertise or whatever that doctor's familiarity is with when it comes to menopause. And and someone who claims themselves to be a specialist is probably someone. So in any given day, a doctor might see 20, 25 people, maybe a really busy doctor sees more like 30 or even 35. Uh, A doctor who's not as busy maybe sees 10. And you want to go to someone who's working with menopause clients pretty much like if they're seeing 20 clients, 15 of those clients are menopause or half of those clients are menopause. And similarly, like if you, if you have fibroids, you want to go to a doctor, that's mo- the majority of their clients that they see and their any, their slot for the day is, are, are working with fibroids and kind of managing fibroids. And so that's kind of what, um, what a woman can get is just someone who has much more experience and theory. So, you know, any doctor can read the theory, can read the research, can, can get up to date on what's going on with the treatment options, but to actually have that in practice and that theory in practice, that's why going to a specialist or an expert or someone who says that this is what I really specialize in. And I like to treat is going to get, they're just going to get more experience, more knowledge, more knowledge base to draw from. And, you know, I think that's so very true. Whenever I was going through menopause in my 40s, um, my doctor was the same age as me. And I loved my gynecologist, my OBGYN, <laughs> but she was really honest with me. And she says, you know, there, I, there's just not a lot of data yet and information. And so I never did any hormone therapy or anything. I just um, went through and and my menopause wasn't terrible, but now later in my fifties and sixties, I have other things that are, have come up that 
uh, as I'm talking to you experts, it seems that they could have maybe been avoided, avoided if I would have done those other things. So um, I think it's just really important that you do go to someone that sees the same thing or same um, issue over and over because you have, as you said, a breadth of of, of knowledge than to, to go from and, and test cases, if you will. Yeah, definitely. So how does testing patients on their individual level promote better health? And how do you see that impacting the healthcare for the future? Yeah. So precision medicine is the wave of the future. I think that we're kind of en entering what some call medicine 3.0. So medicine 1.0, the first version of med medicine was, you know, what we had in the, the medieval ages, herbs and, you know, healers and drink water, get some herbs and, and hope for the best. Then we kind of had the advent of antibiotics and a little bit more um, retrovirals, vaccines. That's kind of what came about in the 1900, you know, 1940s to pr pretty much where we are today. The new era of medicine is going to be this highly precise level of tailorized, customized treatment where we're going to be able to take someone's genetics, someone's genomic information, and their micronutrient information down to the cellular level. So not just looking at the, the blood level or the plasma level down to the cellular level. We're going to be able to look at the gut microbiome. We're going to be able to look at stool analysis and urine metabolites and get so much more information than we were getting with traditional, you know, you go to your annual doctor and get 10 blood tests run and and that's, you know, basically what a lot of your treatment is made off of. 80% of decisions that are made today in medicine are made, made with lab laboratory information. And every day that uh, our ability to get more information from things like genomics, RNA, plasma, serum is just increasing exponentially. And that's where precision diagnostics, precision medicine treatment is really going. Mm-hmm. So my question is, you know, all the things that you describe is uh, something that you or folks that do what you do, um, is it covered by insurance? Yeah. So unfortunately or fortunately, because I, sometimes I like to see things as, as opportunities, um, the insurer-based system and the payer-based system is really going to crisis care, sick care. And it's not, and it hasn't been for a while covering wellness mm -hmm. optimization um, and, and prevention medicine. Mm -hmm. So prevention medicine still exists, but insurance is really about, do you have cancer? Are you sick? Are you in crisis? Do you have a chronic condition? It's kind of like collision coverage on your car versus, you know, getting your car's oil changed and making sure your tires are rotated, making sure your car has all the fluids it needs. All of those things for the car come on top of it. Um, so most of what we do in prevention medicine is not covered by insurance. And I don't see insurance going to a place where it is going to cover services like ours, unfortunately, in the near future. Mm -hmm. and, and I kind of make it akin to like, you know, most of these insurance companies, United Healthcare, Aetna, are publicly traded companies that don't really make anything. And the only way for them to continue to increase profits and beat earnings quarter over quarter is to take money from people, to take money from large corporations who are buying into their plans, and to take money from from doctors. And so these tests aren't cheap. You know, a precision medicine test costs around $250 to $300 a piece. And they're not going to make their earnings and beat profits covering prevention care. So that's mm -hmm. unfortunately, or maybe it's an opportunity for there to be a new system. That's kind of where we are with this type right. of medicine. Right. So can hormone replacement therapy help relieve menopause symptoms and what are the risks and benefits? So that's a really great question that we could probably even spend the whole 30 minutes yeah. talking about just that. Hormone replacement therapy is one of the most effective treatments that we have in medicine for a certain condition. So Estrogen specifically is incredibly effective for hot flashes, vasomotor symptoms, vaginal dryness, vaginal pain, changes in sexual function and libido. 
It's also incredibly effective for the long-term benefits that you might've been talking about in the beginning of what happens in your 60s and 70s if you don't use estrogen replacement therapy in your 40s and 50s for bone uh, loss prevention, mm -hmm cognitive decline and Alzheimer's prevention, as well as cardio protection. So estrogen should be considered, hopefully, um, one of the cardio protective measures right along Lipitor and right along the drugs we use to kind of control cholesterol. A lot of times women will start to notice cholesterol rise as they get into their 50s and 60s when they don't do anything different, nothing's changed because mm -hmm. of the loss of estrogen, which is incredibly cardio protective. As far as the risks, so it's kind of the risks with any hormone. So if someone has diabetes and they need to take insulin, if you take too much insulin, it can actually kill you. If you don't take enough insulin, you can also be in a pretty sick and weakened state. Similarly to thyroid medication. If you take too much thyroid medication, you can put yourself into thyroid storm. And if you don't take enough thyroid medication, you can have a lot of uh, metabolism uh, struggles, sleep, weight, hair, et cetera. So this type of hormone replacement therapy is the same. So when you, you have to hit the dosage correctly, otherwise you're going to run into risks. There is a very large misconception about estrogen specifically. So hormone replacement therapy doesn't just include estrogen. It can include testosterone. It can include progesterone, a hormone mm -hmm. called DHEA. There's even some people, and there's debate about whether it actually works, but pregnenolone is another hormone that's replaced when talking about HRT. But there's a really big um, disbelief that estrogen causes breast cancer. And that came from a study from 2002 called the WHI study. And it has been since proven to be false. Estrogen mm -hmm. does not cause breast cancer. Estrogen in some cases can actually decrease your chance of breast cancer. And it's, there's a great book called, and I know it's, oh, it causes a lot of debate, but there's a great book called Estrogen Matters that was written by an oncologist, uh, a physician oncologist. His wife had breast cancer at 45. He gave her estrogen replacement and about why estrogen does not cause breast cancer. They have a website. They continually update it with the studies that kind of continue to prove that estrogen does not cause breast cancer. So when we talk about the risks of HRT, we like to take breast cancer off the table. And even someone who is a breast cancer survivor, they still could be in some cases a candidate for HRT. And um, it's, it's one of the things that I think is hard to break through in the stigma about HRT is that that's not actually a risk. Right. So what is the long-term, uh, the potential long-term health risk if you, um, as you go through menopause and as you said, with your heart and your cognitive, uh, decline. So what, what are some of the th things that you've seen from folks? So, um, you know, HRT is, um, again, not without risks and benefits, a lot of the benefits that we've seen with women who take estrogen specifically when it come to cardio protection is we see the less need for stat statins or um, lipid lowering medications. Sometimes they don't need them at all. Sometimes they just need a lower dose. We see women who actually have increased cardio um, uh, peripheral cir circulation. And so um, sometimes it can even help to control blood pressure. It can also help women. Um, it can reduce a, a woman's risk of having a stroke. And then one of the things that I think nobody really talks about when talking about cardio protection is the risk of vascular dementia reduction. So Alzheimer's and um, cognitive decline isn't just related to brain activity and, and um, what's going on with the deterioration of neurons um, or cells in the brain. Mm -hmm. It also can be related to microstrokes or mini strokes that happen in the microcirculation in the brain, which can lead to something called vascular dementia or dementia that's coming from a disease of the vascular system. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the major benefits that we've seen. One of the risks about this, uh, using this type of therapy is that we can, we can calculate someone's cardiovascular risk score based on a lot of different factors. So based on their blood pressure, their age, their family history, um, and their lipid levels, we can come up with a cardiovascular risk score. If that cardiovascular risk score is too high and a woman has never been on estrogen in the past and too many years have passed, usually 10, 12 years have passed, 
giving estrogen to a woman like that can sometimes actually increase the risk of stroke because estrogen is, is helping to dislodge arthrosclerotic plaque that's mm -hmm. built up. But if you take the estrogen before the plaque has been laid down, it's going to prevent that plaque from building up and then push out cardiovascular disease into the much, much later decades, 90s, or even hopefully hundreds, theoretically, of a woman's life versus the 70s or 80s. So I know I've done for the last eight years um, life screening, so where they do all those tests and give me readouts of to monitor just as what you're talking about. And um, so is that another tool that you could use for making that determination if someone is, you know, at risk? Yeah, I think that we use the cardiovascular risk score a lot, especially if someone is 10 years or more from menopause and they want to use estrogen for cardio protection. And technically it's not FDA approved. It's not something that is recommended, although the benefits are still there. So there's lots of medications that we use. I give the example of a medication called Cytotec all the time. Cytotec is a drug that we use to induce labor and it's not even FDA approved for pregnant women. It's used everywhere in every hospital in the US every single day multiple times a day and it's not FDA approved. So the um, we can use the cardiovascular risk score for women who sometimes are more than a decade from menopause and they still want to use HRT to help mitigate things like joint pain and bone loss, cardio protection, vascular protection, things like that. So what are some... Um... I guess when we talked earlier about um, some libido and, and whatnot, so can menopause cause changes in the sexual function and what can women do to maintain um, intimacy and, and sexual health? One of the things that we love to, to recommend is est vaginal estrogen, which does not get into the systemic system. So it does not um, usually harm women with the side effects that they're used to thinking about when it comes to estrogen or high estrogenic states. Also someone who has a concern about breast cancer and hasn't really kind of understood all the literature and research, um, they still have a fear of taking estrogen. Vaginal estrogen is incredibly helpful for all of the things that kind of go along with um, changes in sexual function that come with menopause. So a lot of them can be things like vaginal dryness, pain with sex. There can actually be changes in the rugae or the folds of the vagina. So some women will actually notice a color change or they'll notice a um, actual um, physical change of the vagina. Sometimes they'll have um, less intense um, pleasure or they'll have no more pleasure from having sex. And women all the time will be like, you know, I haven't had, I haven't experienced pleasure with sex for 10 years, five years. Is this something that has just gone forever or is there something I can do? And there's absolutely something that can be done. Um, women will notice changes in libido. They'll notice change in, changes in motivation for sex. Um, a lot of times I think women think it's associated with their partner and it may or may not be depending on what's going on in any given relationship, but it absolutely could be hormonal as well. And so there's a lot of tools. There's a lot of tricks, a lot of things that we can do to explore, um, what to do about loss of libido, not just with estrogen, but also with testosterone or with vaginal DHEA, which converts to testosterone and estrogen. It can be really helpful for women who are experiencing any changes. And so I always say like, don't just suck it up and, and grin and bear it. You can seek a menopausal expert who a lot of times can help mitigate and solve for these concerns, even if they've been going on for years. So, it's almost time for us to wrap it up. Um, I wanted to just give you one rapid fire question, which was what do genetics and family history play in the menopause and how can women understand what their risk factors are? So the field of genetics, we're just starting to scratch the surface of it's TBD on what genetics is going to tell us about menopause specifically, but we do know that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of genetics that are related to hormone metabolism. And so they can be really helpful to understand not only why there's a decrease at a certain time, but also how to treat and how to treat it effectively. So we're dosing correctly. Um, when it comes to family history, I don't find very similarly to how I didn't find a connection with how a woman gave birth 
and how her mother gave birth or how her sisters gave birth or how her aunts and uncles gave birth because she's 50% also from her father's side. So the female line doesn't necessarily carry on. If your woman had a horrible menopause that lasted a decade, you could have a menopause where you barely feel a symptom. And so family history doesn't play a lot into menopause specifically, into the risk of bone loss and cardiovascular health and metabolic disease, cancer and cognitive decline, family risk definitely plays a, a big role. Awesome. Well, for those that are just listening, you know, you should be running to get that paper and pencil because I'm going to share the contact information for Kristen. So for those that are listening, you want to go to the website, which is femgevityhealth. Dot com. That's F-E-M-G-E-V-I-T-Y health.com. And at Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, you can thank Kristen. It's all the same, different spellings, but if you just put in Femgevity, you'll be able to find Kristen. I'm going to turn it over to Kristen to talk to you about what you find when you go to her website or the social medias that might be able to get you answers or any help that you might need. So Kristen, take it away. Yeah. So our website is femgevityhealth.com and that's where women can find a lot of information, blogs, helpful tips about what to do during menopause. We also have a, um, a telemedicine service so we can treat women remotely. We can, um, bring them on board into our system and we can treat them just as if they would go to an in-person doctor's office. It's just handle everything's kind of happening in the computer and help them to understand um, what's going on, what's what are the all the options for them to seek treatment. We do a lot of functional medicine testing, which we mail to the home. Everything's collected in the home then mailed back to us where we can analyze gut microbiome. We do a lot of things with allergy. We do genetics and then obviously hormone testing and analysis. Um, we also have a plan for coaching. So if someone doesn't want medical treatment and they just want someone to kind of help them navigate their own medical treatment, we do coaching as well. Awesome. All right. That has been a uh... A lot of great advice given today. So if you want to be able to connect with Kristen, please take a screenshot now if you're just watching. And if you're listening, don't forget everything can be found on my YouTube channel, Vicki Nettling. Please subscribe, as well as my findyourleadershipconfidence.com. Again, the website for Kristen is femgevityhealth.com. Well, Kristen, it's always wonderful to chat about how we can improve our women's health. And, and you know, I am excited to be and hopeful that we can get to be more preventative. I, I think in the long run, I think that will help our health system much more than the what we do today. <laughs> but I know it's a long road. All right. Thank you again for being a wonderful guest. I appreciate all the tips that you shared today and in, in expert information. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to be here. And as always, I remind everyone that life is a journey and it's up to you to enjoy the ride. This is Vicki Nettling signing off. Thank you for tuning into the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nettling, where we share impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Remember to visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast.